StartupRad.io, your podcast and YouTube blog covering the German startup scene with news, interviews, and live events. Hey guys, hello and welcome everybody. This is Joe from StartupRate.io bringing you today another entrepreneur interview. This time is so to say um, the second part of an interview because um, Matthias is here, my guest, but actually I have been interviewing in German back in 2015. He's now and then co-founder Christian when they have been starting the company Sandcap. But before we get into all the stories of Sandcap, Billy and so on, I would like to welcome Matthias Knecht, co-founder of Billy here in my podcast. Welcome. Hi, Joe. Thanks for having me. Totally my pleasure. Um, we may say that Billy is a fintech headquartered in Berlin, and you are officially the co-founder of the company. What, what is your actual role, or do, do you wear like a trillion hats? Joe, oh gosh, um, I think as a co-founder, and uh, I would call myself a co-CEO as well, you're, you're indeed wearing a trillion hats. Um, I think now that we are a bit larger with like 150 people, we can already delegate some of the hats to some of our um, senior management team. But indeed, as a founder, I think you're always responsible for at least half the company. So the hats keep on sticking to my head. I see. I have... Uh, I have been following you a little bit on LinkedIn and I can tell you have originally a background in engineering also with uh, some twists towards finance economics and capital markets and then you did a PhD with a stint at Columbia University so tell us how was New York where was your uh, most loved breakfast nook and of course, what did you write about? That's right, uh, Joe. I, I indeed studied at the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and I did my master's in engineering and management. That's what it's called. So there, it, it's a highly technical and mathematical university. So half of the studies were in engineering um, subjects, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, these kind of things. The other half was in finance and economics. So bringing both together was incredibly exciting for me. That's why, why I chose this um, this course of study. And indeed, after finishing uh, university, I then started out with McKinsey. And during these McKinsey years, I took two years off to do my PhD in Nuremberg in Germany, but then also half of the time at Columbia, New York. And that was a very special time in my life. Um, you know, like being a researcher, PhD student, taking part at PhD courses, also MBA courses at Columbia, and then just experiencing the city. It was like in 2000, um, I guess it was 2010, 11, when I was in New York. Um, yeah, my, my, my favorite breakfast place that is a very special, nice little place. It's called the Clinton Street Baking Company. I hope it's still existing. Uh, I haven't been for a long time. It's in Lower East Side um, with an amazing pancake breakfast. So whenever in, you're in New York, you should try to check it out. But you also need to bring a lot of time. Usually the, the queues in front of this place are usually like 45 minutes to an hour until just to get in to get your pancakes. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I checked while you've been talking and uh, Google says they are still in business. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> I assume since you did such a lot of um, management, like mathematical driven plus engineering, your math skills have to be pretty good. Well, I mean, that's I think that's a given in, in this kind of um, course of study. Uh, yes, we you, you need to go through it. It was a very, very painful uh, experience, to be honest, like uh, working through it. But at the end, I, I believe it paid off. And then later on, um, even though I didn't know exactly why I was going through this at the time at university, later on working at McKinsey or now here uh, at my at my second startup, I think this kind of very structured way of thinking and, and structuring problems, I think that helps a lot a little later on, even though I probably couldn't solve the equations that I did back in the days uh, nowadays. I think that's, that's a time that has passed. 
I would be wondering, what did you write about in your PhD thesis? What was it about, like numbers theory, or did you write something about something a non-mathematician could understand? Oh, you can actually Google it. I think it's still on Amazon. Um, so it's about um, industry diversification. So how large conglomerates diversify across different industries and how dynam how the dynamism of markets is affecting the success of diversified conglomerates. So, you know, I, I was thinking about like, if you are a highly diversified company with different business units in different markets, are you affected by the dynamism, the cycles of the different market types that you're in? Um, I think one example back in the days was um, Siemens, our very large German company. They, on the one side, produce power plants and turbines. Then they also produce our ICE, our bullet trains here in Germany. But then they also produced mobile phones, so very different markets with very different market dynamics and cycles. And how does this all fit together under one roof. I think this was like the core of the thesis. Mm -hmm. And afterwards, you joined McKinsey again, but then you left to found Sencap. Can you tell us a little bit about what decision went into founding Sencap? And looking back now, would you consider Sencap a success or failure? Yeah, the decision that went into founding my first company was, I think, a, a very simple one. You know, being a consultant was was a great experience. I worked for McKinsey for five and a half years, um, and I was working for very different German companies, usually banks or other financial institutes, insurance players, private equity companies, but also car manufacturers and others. And that was a great experience because you got exposed to very exciting and complicated problems. You were working with an exciting McKinsey team, but also on the client side with very, very uh, interesting people. At the same time, after a while, I had the feeling that I was working on solutions and designing and producing concepts, which we hope make sense. But then at the same time, we were never really responsible for putting them into practice, right? So you were like designing these amazing concepts together with the client, had a lot of fun doing so. But then when these concepts got implemented and you hopefully would at some point see the outcomes of it, as a consultant, you usually leave the company. So you were never on the playing field, but usually standing on the sidelines and coaching or trying to coach. And that was something that I said after a while, look, I want to get onto the playing field. I really want to be responsible for um, the success or for the failures of my own decisions. And that was when I think it grew within me to say, look, I want to like found or lead my own company. And these were the days when fintech became a word. Like it was like mid and, and late 2013, early 2014, when we founded the company. That was a time when some of the fintech, the early fintech models came from the U.S., to continental Europe, and we became aware of this, these amazing things that you could do with financial technology. Um, and I think there was this kind of, you know, um, these kind of many things coming together on the one side, the technology area, founding a company, but then also the financial area, which I was working on for McKinsey and all together made up the, the perfect time for me. I remember this time and actually in 2014, I did the first annual fintech review, which is still around today and is still published on the 25th of December in the morning. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the story of Sandcap, what you guys did and, um, how, how you ended up exiting? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I think. Like end of 2013, beginning of 2014, this was a time when we've seen in other countries, like especially US, but also a little bit in the UK, that some of the first business models of banks got disrupted by fintech. The payment players like PayPal and also Klarna have already been founded and were working on consumer payments, but then came up lending models. We had Lending Club in the US, we have Funding Circle in the UK concentrating on business loans, but we had no real innovation here in continental Europe. So we said, look, why don't we like try to work out how digital lending 
can also be implemented here and hopefully change the landscape here in continental Europe. And these were the times when we then were working on these solutions, on these ideas. Um, we teamed up with investors here in Germany, amongst them Rocket Internet and Oli Zumber, and said, look, why don't we bring this here to Europe? I mean, we have a very old school banking markets. Back in the days, we had like 1,003, 1,400 different banks in Germany, but none of them really was focused on using like new technologies to disrupt into uh, the landscape and also to bring um, a more innovative and streamlined product to the market. So that's what we set out to do. And we focused on a specific type of lending. We focused on small business lending. So lending, especially to these small and micro companies, be it a freelance or sole trader or a company with half a dozen or a dozen people who have probably a, a bit more difficulties getting a loan than mid to large sized corporates. So this was a segment where I said, look, here innovation can help in terms of more or less fully automating the lending uh, business and then also distributing loans to these small companies. And I think for me, you know, looking back at these different periods in my life, when I look back at the McKinsey experience, I think this was a time when I learned a lot with regards to the toolkit that I could apply later on, like disaggregating problems, working very analytically. And this also shaped in a good way or a bad way my work ethics. Um, but then again, at Zencat, my first company, which I founded together with my also now co-founder, Christian, Christian Grobe, um, here, I think we we just learned how to build a company. You know, when we founded Zencap, we didn't have a clue, to be honest. We didn't know how it worked. We didn't know how to, we didn't, I didn't even know what a CTO is or how product management works. We didn't know how to set up a finance department. I couldn't differentiate sales from marketing. So there was like these very fundamental things that like in hindsight, I really didn't have a clue about. So this were, this was a very steep learning curve at the very beginning. And we probably, um, yeah, we've, we've done so many things wrong, which however now benefits us by, um, in our second company. You eventually sold the company to Funding Circle based in the UK. Um, do you consider this a successful exit looking back now? Oh, this for us was, was a tremendous success. Um, and, and we didn't even plan for selling our company that early, right? We sold Zencap within the first two years of founding it. And this was never planned like that. Um, we were building the company. We were present in three countries, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, and had offices in um, all these countries in Berlin, Madrid, and Amsterdam. But then, you know, I was at one of these conferences. I remember like it was yesterday when I was in New York at um, at a hotel close to Times Square um, at a so-called Lended conference. And all these like new fintech um, founders and CEOs were meeting there. And then, like the funding back then, the funding circle founder and CEO came up to me and said, "Hey, Matthias, like, why don't we have a coffee? Let's talk." And uh, we had a very good uh, discussion about how lending would evolve, how um, Europe and also the US should and need to change in this regard. And then we started discussing why don't we build like a dominant player together? Why don't we combine these two companies? Funding circle back in the days was present in the UK and also. In the US, they acquired a company there to enter the US market. So they had these two um, markets, and we were present in our three um, European geographies, and we are the fastest growing player here. So combining these two entities um, from a strategic perspective made a lot of sense. So that was, I think, the trigger point to then enter in such an MA process. And at the end of it, we indeed sold the company to Funding Circle. We became part of the Funding Circle management team and hey, the, the rest is history. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you then left the company and I would be curious how you found the idea for Billy. So at Billy, we're talking about um, basically I'm a small merchant. I do have accounts receivable worth, let's say, 100 euros to make it easy and you pay 97.5 for it, but I have the cash now. That's basically the idea of factoring. Um, how did you start with this idea? I mean, it, in in terms of topics, um, getting liquidity to companies, 
you've been sticking with the same topic, but um, how did you come up with this idea? Was it also something you wish you had when you've been an entrepreneur? Yeah, absolutely. You know, we um, during the time at Funding Zerker and Zencap, we had so many ideas coming our way. Um, and most of them came from our customers asking us, hey, could you please help me with this or that problem? And, and many of these customers came to us asking us for certain types of liquidity solutions. And back in the days, we had installment loans as a product. We could do six-month loans or one, two, three, four, five-year loans. But we couldn't really help customers who said, look, we, I want to pay my employees by end of the month. I want to stock up my warehouse for the Christmas sale. Like these kind of short-term liquidity working capital management problems, we really didn't have an appropriate product for. We only had installment loans, which is a good product in itself, but it doesn't solve all the problems of these companies. So here it was clear that there was a niche in the market. And next to this, other companies also asked us if we can help them with their B2B payments. They are paying out to their suppliers. They receive payments from their customer. And there was a lot of friction in these processes since the B2B payment processes in itself were not smooth, not aligned, not digitized back in these days. So I think bringing these two together made a lot of sense. So we decided to then found our own company to tackle some of the challenges. And the first challenge we wanted to tackle was indeed working capital management for these small and micro companies. And that is basically the idea on which Billy was built, but it's not the only product you're doing right now. But b before we get into that, j just a little bit of the frame, because we we uh, listened to across the world and um, which companies would be eligible for getting this factoring service, this fast liquidity selling accounts receivable to you. Mm. Yeah, I mean, in terms of eligibility, um, we try to open it up for literally all the SMEs out there, so small and medium-sized enterprises. Um, our customers back then had an average like five to 10 million in annual revenue, could be as small as a freelancer, but also could be as large as a company with 50 people and uh, 100 million revenue. So there was like, this was like our target segment. Most of the companies came to us because, of course, they want working capital financing, but also because of the ease uh, of the process. We tried to do the, the customer onboarding fully automatically, the invoice approvals, the risk assessment, all these kind of core capabilities that we built back in the days, um, we tried to build on a fully automated basis. Um, we learned a lot at Funding Circle and Zencap. We also learned a lot how not to build things. So the second time around, we said, look, the data infrastructure, the risk systems, the refinancing, the collection processes, all these things need to be as automated as possible right from the start. Right? We didn't want to build old school banking processes, which we then would need to digitize later on, but we literally wanted to start in a fully automated way. That's how we built the company. But then, um, as you already indicated, we also like released other products that um, I think are at least as exciting as the first one. And talking about this, because you are doing something, a uh, European unicorn called Klana does. This is buy now, pay later, but in the B2B environment. And first thought was, hmm, that may be a competitor of Klana, even though you're not in the same market. And then I was going on Crunchbase and checking you out and Klana is actually one of your investors. So at, at, at first, I want to know, how did you come up with the idea? And secondly, was there first Klana as investor or first the product offering? <laughs> is that already in Crunchbase? I, okay, I need to check this out. That That's indeed right. So Klarna participated with a small ticket in our last funding round, which we raised last year in 2021, end of 2021. Um, so Klarna is now indeed a, a small shareholder of Billy. And as you said, we are now concentrating our efforts on buy now, pay later for B2B customers. And how it came to this was also, to be honest, quite simple, you know. We had many customers back in the days coming to us and say, look, you are helping these small, medium-sized companies with financing their accounts receivable, which is an amazing technology. Could you please also do this for me? I'm selling my goods, not online, but not offline, but online. So I'm a B2B online shop. Could you please do more or less the same thing for me? Um, and there, it's not just about liquidity. It's also about um, fully automated UX optimized checkout experience 
about the whole accounts receivable management, the payment reconciliation, the incoming payments that need to be matched to the open invoices, but then also about services which you can offer to the buyers in such a checkout. I'll come to that maybe a little later. So we were basically driven by customer demand and then said, look, we have all of the technology already. Why don't we just like plug it into a online checkout and then create literally the first full-fledged B2B buy now pay later product? So that was the beginning of a very exciting journey for us. Um, and coming out of such an idea, it, it was at the beginning more or less an R&D lab where we just tested out things and tried out things. But then we have seen, look, the market demand is so massive for this product. Let's really turn it into our main product. Let's give it a nice and shiny user interface and start working on it and distributing it to a lot of customers. Okay, so so the idea was first, and then yeah. I, I didn't I, answer your question, I, uh, Joe. Yeah, no, 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 <laughs> I, I I would be curious because um, yeah. basically you told me the product was first, but then I would be curious: Did you find Klana in a normal pitch, or did they realize you do something similar and they reached out to you? Yeah. Oh no, you know the the startup scene, fintech scene is so small that most people know each other, so it wasn't like any formal pitch. Or so we know Klana for. Uh, for more than two years by now. And um, we know some of the sea level of Klarna. We know Sebastian, uh, the founder, also personally. So there was al already quite a connection going on. And, you know, I think also Klarna realized over time that they are like the champion in B2C by now, pay later. They have a massive proposition here. They have an incredibly smooth product. They have a nice uh, Klarna app. They have more than 100 million customers, like, consumers on the Klarna app. So it's an amazing ecosystem that they've built and they're offering a lot more than just buy now, pay later. They have become by now an e-commerce shopping platform for consumers also offering credit card, a full-fledged bank account and, and many more things. So Klarna is centered around the consumer as a value proposition, as, as, as the core user. And this is, I think, what they, are, what they want to build on. They have Lady Gaga and Snoop Dogg as their Uh, as their yeah, brand ambassadors and have this crazy, super nice pink branding. So it's all around the consumer. At the same time, I think what Klarna recognizes is that if you have a merchant that you're serving with your payment method, the merchants might have a B2C checkout, but they might also have a B2B checkout. And if you're only serving one side of the coin, for many merchants, it's not enough. They also want their B2B, their business checkout to be served. And here, I think Klarna decided not to try to build an own product. Actually, they, they actually try to build it in Sweden and other countries, but I think for them, it was not the right focus. So they said, look, let's partner with the leading provider in this space and just integrate them into the Klarna, Klarna platform. And that's exactly what we did, right? We were in long discussions with Klarna. We um, showed our product back and forth, and then we both decided that that's a great partnership. So by now, just beginning of the year, we've finished our integration with Klarna. So now Klarna customers, so the, the online shops that use Klarna, they can use Billy as a payment method through the standing Klarna integration. So there's no separate integration required. We can just go live and serve the business checkout of each Klarna merchant. Right? And I think by doing so, we have removed one of the major hurdles of implementing a new payment method, that is the technical integration, the effort to really launch um, such a payment method in your checkout, that's all gone. So these um, Klarna merchants can now use the B2B payments quite uh, effectively. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I would be curious how you do the risk management for your side, because uh, buy now, pay later includes a risk, of course, for you as well as for the clients. How are you dealing here with the risk management? And is it also like a very smooth uh, automated process or do you still need a lot of risk analysts there? Yeah. Oh, Joe, I, I could talk for hours about this. This is, uh, this is probably one of oh, the... Oh, we got time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll try to be as specific as I can. This is one of the core, I think, IP intellectual property areas in, in a company like ours to, to do the risk management right in such a product. And this can make or break your company, right? If you do this right, you can be very profitable. You keep default rates low. You keep checkout conversion rates and end-to-end -end acceptance rates very high. At the same time, if you mess it up, 
look, this is a big balance sheet risk because then these kind of receivables and transactions, they're just blowing up in your face um, because you are taking over the risk of these transactions as such a provider. So risk management is at the heart of what we're doing. And we have a data science team of nearly two dozen people who's doing nothing else than, than developing these kind of machine learning models that are managing the risk that we're buying. So I would actually even go a little bit further. Risk management is one part of the checkout experience. And to answer one of your questions, yes, it needs to be instant. There is no human uh, manual decision being taken. All of the decisions in the checkout are taken by our different models. Um, risk management is one part of it. You have another part, which is identification. So identifying your counterparty in the checkout is, it sounds simple, but it's for B2B actually quite challenging. And third, it's also, you have limit systems, like how much limit, how much exposure can you accumulate against the counterparty in the checkout? So can you do 100 euro, 1,000 euro, 50,000, 100,000 euro? So what is the exposure you're willing to accept against your counterparty? And these three systems, identification, risk management, and the limit systems, they need to play together and all of them uh, then define your end-to-end -end acceptance rate, which for us is one of the core KPIs that we are trying to optimize for. So coming to your question on risk management, there are at least two major types of risk. One is credit risk, the other one is fraud risk. And fraud risk mostly comes from um, identity theft or other ways that you have like a, um, like a buyer that is trying to fraud you. Like this kind of, black, let's think about them as black hat buyers that just really want to get the products and run away. So managing credit risk and fraud risk are key. Both of them require different data points and different ways of assessing it. And if you're looking at online transactions as, as we do, fraud risk is usually the major risk category, not for all sectors, but for most sectors. If you think about it, we are serving electronics merchants or other merchants who have high value goods that you can easily be resold. Here, of course, you have a high risk that these transactions can be fraudulent. So your fraud bonds need to be quite strong. So how you do this, and I can just explain this on a high level, is um, you are using external data providers, you're using internal data, you're looking at the transaction type, you're looking at the also at the flow of transaction, what is in the basket uh, that is just being shopped, where does the the pin come from, which I, which IP addresses it, can or can you not use device ID fingerprinting, how frequently do these transactions come into your system from a certain buying entity. So there are many ways uh, to look at this, plus you're combining this usually with different types of external data sources to then define if or if not you think this is a fraudster and if or if not you think this credit risk can be accepted or should be rejected and you know combining this all needs to happen within two to three hundred milliseconds because for the buyer it needs to feel instant so you cannot go back and say oh i have my analyst now looking at this this all needs to be instant and this is how the systems need to be trained um that m means you do pay a lot to cloud providers for a lot of computer resources. I, I would be curious if, if you could talk about this. What is the coolest product you are, uh, you are funding for merchants? For example, uh, um, spe specialist equipment, uh, f for, uh, haircuts for dogs, for example. And secondly, what was the most outrageous fraud you can a uh, fraud attempt you can remember wow these are two 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 exciting questions um let me answer the second one first the most most outrageous fraud on on this product we have so this factoring product where we have different types of fraud but on the buy now pay later product we once suffered a fraud attack from a number of fraudsters who seem to have launched a coordinated fraud attack against our systems against some of the many shops we are integrated with they for somehow they have figured out where billy is managing the checkout and then probably tried to attack all of these checkouts at once at least that's what it looked like they all came from a certain geographical region in germany it was a city of hamburg like we had like many attacks from hamburg in a certain given period of time and these frauds tried to buy um, high value goods and while the merchants were shipping the goods to try to change the delivery addresses to some other addresses or to some Parkstation or to some other like 
receptive um, areas where you can easily get the package and then run away with it without necessarily needing to identify you, right? So I think this is one fraud attempt where um, people try to reroute packages to other areas and just grab them and run away. And we have spotted it luckily quite uh, quite early on, then uh, identified the process and shut down the fraud attempt. But this, you can see this as a little spike in our default, uh, in our default curve. Um, that uh, that that fraud that happened, and for us, I think it's it's not so much um, critical that these fraud attempts happen. You'll always have them. It's always a cat and mouse problem, right? That fraudsters try to be smarter than you, then you catch up, and then other fraud patterns emerge. The important thing is that you are on the one side fast enough to recognize these fraud attempts, but second, also have certain limit systems or other checks in place so that if something like this hits you it doesn't completely destroy your company right so you should never be exposed to certain fat finger risks where suddenly you have like a couple of zeros more in terms of fraud than you 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 really have this is something that that may not happen to your company and i think that the most um exciting fraud product you know there was one yeah i probably can tell this one story um there's one company that we serve or one merchant that we serve that told us look we have one fraud pattern that we know of, but for some reason we can't prevent. There's this one fraudster who is continuously stealing from us, but he always puts a package of cookies into his basket. So for whatever reason, I, I don't know why this fraudster puts a package of cookies in his basket and then tries to fraud. So it would be actually pretty simple to spot this foster, whenever this package of cookie is somewhere in this bus, you should probably reject the transaction. But for some reason, the merchant wasn't able to do it because it didn't have the systems to go through basket cases and then reject on a certain like line item um, order basis, a certain transaction, which is something, of course, we can do, but the merchant could, they just don't have the infrastructure. So this was, I think, a funny thing, spotting a foster by their preference for certain types of cookie. That sounds pretty good. Uh, we we have been digging quite a lot deep into Billy, and um, I would have now a few questions looking more a little bit at the future. Of course, uh, right now the important question um, many people are asking is: um, Are you guys currently hiring when you have such a lot of uh, high end computer equipment and stuff to do? Oh yeah, we are. We are, we have completely open doors. Right, hiring is literally one of our major challenges to get top talent on board as quickly as we can. We are hiring across all the levels, from ski level down to analyst and also working students. So the doors are very wide open, especially for all talent, literally across departments, from engineering to product, even to finance, marketing, sales, operations. Like literally across all the different um, departments, we have doors are wide open. We are sitting in Berlin, so Berlin's our headquarter. We have started, like as probably many companies did during the COVID pandemic, to start also hiring remotely just to get access to more talent. And we can also employ people um, fully remotely. So here, I think the, the opportunities are unlimited. Um, Billy is at a very, very exciting stage of its, of its company life. So um, everybody who wants to join us is highly welcome to just send, uh, send the CV over. Mm -hmm. Also talk about your funding. You have a pretty published, a pretty well published Series B and Series C already under your belt. And I'm just looking through the investors here: Creandom, Picus Capital, uh, Tencent, Klarna, as we already said, Speed Invest, Global Founders Fund. So pretty interesting investors. You raised a little bit over, I would say, 130 million euros. As of today, because uh, I can't get the data for your Series A or seed investment, so um, that is very likely. Um, the question with uh, such funding numbers is always: When will you be a unicorn? That's right. So the funding numbers you, you mentioned are are directionally correct, and also the investors are are correct. Um, we're missing one of them. The last round was led by Dawn Capital, so Dawn is like one of our latest mm -hmm. investors on the block here. Um, together with Tencent and Klarna, they they made up this uh, this fantastic round. Um, and you know, Joe, I'm I'm indeed I'm not chasing valuations. It's it's probably weird to hear that, but valuations is just one of the outcomes of the work we do. So for me, it's very important that the company is always well capitalized. I really 
I cannot stand uh, the feeling of running against the wall. So that's why we capitalized the company in such a tremendous way. We have all the capital in the world to invest now into the product, into our people, and into internationalizing the company. I think this is what you'll see next. So in terms of the use of funds, we are fully focused in Germany. We are the market leading player, B2B BNRP later in Germany, and will, I think, add to this over the course of the next one and two years. So you'll see a lot um, from us here in this market. But then since the customer demands are ubiquitous across Europe, so you'll see these B2B demands for such a payment solution everywhere. That's why we will bring the solution into more countries together with our partner Klarna, but also together with the other partners. So I think this is where we are investing behind. Usually, as you know, with other startups, launching a new country is unprofitable. So you really like need to invest in the country. You'll probably open an office, you hire the people, you invest in sales and marketing into the country. But then over time, um, these countries will dig themselves out and become contributors to the overall company. So I think this is where how the funds will be used. And you know, I, I don't want to like go into depth of predicting when and how unicorn status will be reached. For me, this is literally an outcome of the work we do. You see, last year, I guess you've seen very high valuations in the startup sector coming from pre-seed seed A to pre-IPO and even, even the IPOs we've seen, I think, were, were tremendously um, expensive, let's put it like this. And what you're seeing already this year, is this valuations have come down. It started with the pre-IPO, the late stage guys, then came over to growth, now it's to a series B, A, and also seed pre-seed. So you'll see, I think pre seed and pre-seed are still very expensive, but I, I trust that you'll also see valuations come down a little bit over there. So the macro environment, the public markets valuations, they are trickling down also the venture capital uh, um, chain down to the pre-seed companies. By saying so, what I'm what I'm saying is I think it'll be it'll be probably a little bit more difficult for most companies to raise right now and to achieve these sky high valuations that we've seen um, last year. However, I also consider this to be a bit more of a healthy environment, right? Having seen companies with, I don't know, more than 100x uh, revenue multiples is just like, it's it's probably un, an unhealthy kind of valuation exp uh, like um, expectation. So this has come down. Um, I'm not saying that we'll never get up to these kind of levels of valuation again, just because there's so much liquidity in the market that also needs to search for an exit somehow. However, I think in the next 12 to 18 months, you'll see somewhat depressed valuations that are probably more, uh, it's a bit of a mean reversion, right? They are probably a little bit more towards the long-term mean than what you've seen last year. Bottom line is uh, unicorn valuation is not uh, totally impossible for you and we'll see it sometime down the road. This is what I've taken from you. Um, would you be nonetheless open to talk to international investors if they see this um, interview and are interested in Billy? Oh yeah, you know, we, we never stop talking to to potential investors. I mean, we are we are incredibly well capitalized at the moment. So our run rate is like, I don't know, even like it's like a couple of years, to be honest, if we keep on burning like we do at the moment. Um, at the same time, we are very opportunistic. Like we are continuously talking to investors. Um, investors understand us. We have a lot of inbound demand. So I, I'm, I'm not talking to all of them, but especially to the ones that I find interesting or we have already pre-existing relationships. Um, so this is something that's going on. Um, and we will fundraise when we think the time is right. That can be very soon. That can be a little later in the process. I think, again, since we are well capitalized, we have all the time in the world. So I'm not rushed by anything. At the same time, the best fundraisers always happen when you don't need the money, right? So that's why we keep our eyes open. We keep on executing. We are really heads down trying to out execute anybody else in the market. And then at some point there will be a right time. And then we are very open to accepting the funds. Yes. Great. Um, only thing left for me to ask you, everybody who would be interested in a job, can you give them a URL where they can find out more in case they're just listening to this on a, on any internet radio station and don't have any URL or something at hand? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think you should just Google billy.io and then jobs, and then you'll find our job page. It's it's very prominent, um, and you can just apply there. Um, Right, so I think it's uh, also the job page. You find the current openings. We try to update them as frequently as we can. Sometimes there are more jobs open than we could put on the website, just because it's changing so rapidly. So, if you are working or if you're interested 
in all of these areas, especially engineering, product, data science, even operations, sales, marketing, and other functions, just look at the website or contact us directly um, by sending your LinkedIn profile or your CV to us. I think we'll definitely look at it. And you're open to remote uh, jobs as well. And for everybody who's watching this or listening to this on one of our channels, go down here in the show notes. There will be a link to the website of Billy and all the other information. Matthias, I have been bothering you with questions for more than 40 minutes now, which is a little bit unusual on the longer side of the interviews. Nonetheless, I enjoyed it a lot because I'm also a fintech geek. And thank you. Thank you very much for all the time. And hope to have you back in sometime, maybe when you're a unicorn. <laughs> It was great chatting, Joe. Thanks a lot for having me. With all my pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye. That's all, folks. Find more news, streams, events, and interviews at www.startuprad.io. Remember, sharing is caring.